has been killed in front of me. October 2002, a ruthless killer stalked the Washington, D.C. area. He only needed a split second, and he could take them out. He murdered random victims. White people, black people, young, old, children. And then he vanished without a trace. How do you find a ghost? Millions were held hostage. I felt like the water was over my head. By the sniper's high-powered rifle, the killing spree shocked the nation. People like this exist in our world. And set off the largest manhunt in American history. <laughs> Montgomery County, Maryland, borders the nation's capital. But it doesn't share Washington, D.C.'s violent reputation. Montgomery is affluent, calm, a safe place to raise kids. But in October 2002, the suburban quiet was shattered by the deafening blast of a sniper's gun. It all began on a Wednesday afternoon at the Glenmont Shopping Center. James Martin decided to pick up some groceries after work before heading home to his wife and 11-year-old son. Out of nowhere, the explosive sound of a bullet. A shopper in the parking lot heard an unsettling groan. She looked up and saw James collapse to the pavement. I'm at Shoppers Through Warehouse on Randolph Road, and a man just fell in the parking lot. There was a loud noise, but we're not sure if he was shot. The frightened caller was hiding behind her car, clutching her five-year-old child. Is he bleeding? Yes. Where is he bleeding from? I don't know. I'm like half an aisle away from him. Is it inside? No, it's outside in a parking lot. Oh, there's a police officer here now. One of the first persons there was a police officer who heard the shot. Martin was unconscious and bleeding heavily from his chest. He was trying to lend medical attention to the victim, but he was also keeping his eyes out looking for suspect information. James Martin died in minutes. An investigator at the crime scene called the assistant chief of police, D. Walker. He explained the circumstances of James Martin's shooting, which were very deeply troubling, obviously. A small entrance wound and a larger exit wound indicated that whoever killed James Martin used a high-powered rifle. I start running through my head the possible causes of something like this because in Montgomery County, we just don't have drive-by shootings involving high-powered weapons. I remember hanging up the phone and just having this feeling of wondering when the other shoe was going to drop. Police searched the area for bullet casings, which can often be traced. They checked the soles of the shoes of witnesses and tire treads in the parking lot. As night fell, police were left with no clues, only questions. Who would want to kill James Martin and why? A terrifying answer began to take shape as the violence continued the next morning. It was earlier in the morning and Sonny Buchanan was cutting the lawn. At first, people at the scene thought Sonny's lawnmower had malfunctioned and wounded him. The call first went out. It went out as a medical emergency. What's going on there? Uh, this guy's lawnmower did something, man. It chopped him up. He's bleeding real bad. He's down and out. So you had fire rescue responding to a medical emergency. But when paramedics arrived, it was clear this was no accident. Sonny was rushed to a trauma center, but by then, his heart had stopped and was completely empty of blood. A surgeon said he bled more than anyone he had ever seen. Sonny Buchanan was the son of a former Montgomery County police officer, so it kind of hit home. Sonny Buchanan's death was only the beginning of the bloodiest morning in the Montgomery County Police Department's history. At 8.07 a.m., a yellow cab pulled into a gas station on Connecticut Avenue. Just 10 feet away, Carolyn Namro was keeping an eye on her toddler as she gassed up her car. Suddenly, she heard a loud boom. Zero, zero, North Mont, apartment four, open 911. She was shocked to see a huge smear of blood across the side of her van. And then, a sight she would never forget. The taxi driver was staggering towards her with an enormous gunshot wound in his chest. Prem Kumar Walaker was dying before her eyes. <laughs> what, ma'am? Oh, my God. Ma'am, listen to me. 
What is wrong? A man is being killed in front of me. How is he being killed in front of you? I don't know. Mr. Walker was shot um, pumping gas into his taxi cab. Hard working taxi driver. Stops to get gas. Two brutal murders in 31 minutes, just five miles apart. And in my head, I heard the thud of the other shoe dropping. A few minutes later, the killer struck again. Sarah Ramos had been waiting for a ride to her house cleaning job. In her native El Salvador, she'd been a law student. But after moving to the US, she made ends meet by cleaning houses. Fire and ambulance. Yes, I need the ambulance to police. Eyewitness accounts only added to the confusion. A girl just shot herself. She just shot herself. Oh, we got a possible 1056 at Leisure Wood. Please advise. It was the third brutal murder in less than an hour. It came out as a, a possible suicide, and that I knew instantly it wasn't. I don't see a weapon. You don't see a weapon? No. This time, police found the bullet that shattered Sarah Ramos's skull. The 223 caliber slug entered her forehead, exited through her neck, pierced a window, and landed on the floor of the restaurant behind her. Chaotic radio traffic filled the airwaves as emergency response teams raced to keep up with the murders. But the killer kept coming. His next victim, a full-time nanny who was cleaning her car at a gas station. Montgomery County had never seen anything like this. We're having a shooting about every half an hour. All five killings were clustered in 10 square miles of Montgomery County. The yearly homicide rate had just shot up 30%, but there was yet another incident in the same area. The day before, employees at a Michael's craft store heard a loud crack and then found a bullet hole in their window. The round just went high. It actually entered at about the six foot level in the window. They've recovered some fragments from an artificial flower in the store. So far, police had found no connection between any of the victims. Different ages, different sexes, different races of the victims. Uh, that was the most uh, troubling part. And there had been no secondary crimes, like robbery, in any of the shootings. Maybe it was a ticked off dad who had, had lost custody of his kids or a terrorist. We knew we had to counter this threat and we knew we had to do it immediately. A sniper or possibly a team of snipers was stalking the people of Montgomery County. So right away, we had to put all our assets out. We had to put them out immediately. We had to go with a quick plan. SWAT teams were deployed throughout the area as police prepared themselves for a battle on the streets. We were going to engage this guy, that he was pulling us along, and we were going to end up in a hot confrontation with him. While some police snipers waited for a possible shootout, other snipers helped with the investigation. We sent out our trained snipers to go to each location to come back and report what they believe happened in these locations. The locations were all public areas, parking lots, and gas stations. Undercover cops flooded these areas in the hopes of catching the sniper in the act. At each crime scene, the detectives faced the same nagging question. Where could someone with a rifle be hiding? There is no grassy knoll. There is no forest or woodland. There is no cover. And for no lookouts to come out, we realized that maybe a vehicle could be involved at this point in time. The one and only lead police had so far seemed to support this theory. We had a witness who had seen a white panel truck in the area where uh, the victim up at Leisure World had been. Uh, apparently, this witness had heard the shot, turned around, and saw that white panel truck. Suddenly, it seemed as if white vans and box trucks were everywhere. Police knew they would find more clues in the bodies of the victims. There were now five corpses at the medical examiner's autopsy office. When finished, the autopsy results could speak volumes. We had to look at if there was any elevation, which would lead us to believe they were taking these shots from rooftops. And we also needed to know what type of damage occurred to these victims on that day. But even before the forensics could be completed, another panicked call came in. Yeah, we got a guy just shot out here. 
That night, Pascal Charlot, a 72-year-old Haitian immigrant, was gunned down while crossing a street. He was right over the Montgomery County line in Washington, D.C. I went to the scene on that, and it kind of led me to believe, like, maybe they saw that this individual was in Washington, D.C., and they wanted to extend the killing field to another location within the metropolitan area. The quiet city of Rockville, Maryland, was about to become the epicenter of a story that would grip the nation, and a small police department would become the headquarters for the biggest manhunt in U.S. history. We felt like we'd stepped off a cliff, and uh, we didn't know how it was going to end. On Friday, October 4th, 2002, Washington, D.C. area residents awoke to a new reality. Pumping gas, going outside, you're much more aware of what's going on around you. The fear was palpable. There was just this sense of, um, of foreboding uh, as people went about doing their work. Six innocent people had been gunned down in less than 48 hours. Police had no suspects, no motive, and very few leads. Now, everyone felt like a target. When people went to put gas in their car, they would bob and weave. People walked down the street, they wouldn't walk in a straight line. Police Chief Charles Moose appointed his most experienced detective to lead the investigation, Barney Forsyth. The chief, of course, asked me, he says, what's the link? And I said, chief, at this point, we don't see a link. And so that's the commonality is that there is no link. And of course, that's one of the most difficult type of cases to deal with. Chief Moose made an early decision to deal with the crisis by presenting as much information as possible to the public. They still all appear to be random victims, don't appear to be anyone's enemy, don't appear to be involved in anything coordinated, just simply random targets. Schools went into lockdown with armed guards out front. Helicopters were everywhere. Meanwhile, the autopsy results showed a consistent pattern. In four of these individuals, it was a center mass shot. The bullets came from a long-range rifle, an AK-47, or a Bushmaster. These rifles that are military rifles, they're, they're built to kill. They're not built just to hurt somebody. They're built to kill them. Ballistics experts confirmed that these were military rounds two 23 caliber bullets fired by a rifle. And it had like a sunburst effect. It goes in small and then it gets wider as it goes through. So what you end up with is that all those organs that are in that range of that cone get injured whether they get hit directly by the bullet or not. The Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms did an analysis. We looked at the different rounds, the way the round uh, hit the victim, and that helped us figure out where the shot may have been taken from. The shots were not coming from rooftops. Somehow, the killer was finding a way to hide in plain sight. Well, I couldn't see how they could escape so quickly. Investigators began to believe the sniper was shooting from a vehicle, which led to a theory that a pair of shooters might be involved. For the purposes of shooting, you want to have room available so you can have some mobility. And that means when you're behind the wheel, you don't have that kind of mobility. The idea that the armed sniper was hiding in a car spread fear like wildfire. Within the past year, Washington area residents had lived through the 9-11 attacks and the anthrax scare. Now, they faced the possibility that a team of terrorists was hunting them down. The Washington Post on the front page says snipers and Al-Qaeda. Those questions were being publicly asked. That afternoon, the sniper turned an awful situation into a nightmare. He widened the terror. Stop 2911, Mr. Emergency. Um, we've had a lady shot in our parking lot. This is Michaels in Fredericksburg. When 43-year-old Carolyn Sewell was gunned down in Virginia, fear reverberated across the entire region. All right, Get away from at? the window. I'm sorry. Where's the person at? She's laying in the parking lot, sir. While laying on the pavement, Carolyn prayed that she could live for her two kids. Say that again, honey. She's laying on the ground between our store and Michael's, and she is moving her arm. There's a lady standing over. There's a lady standing with her. She would become the first survivor of the sniper's long-range bullet. This was the second shooting incident at a Michael's store. Investigators immediately seized on the possible link that could lead to the killer. 
So we looked at disgruntled employees, people that maybe had been terminated, some connection between the Michaels in Maryland and the Michaels in Fredericksburg. Um, of course, nothing was really um, developed. There was nothing there. There was so little, in fact, at every crime scene. After each killing, the shooter vanished into thin air. Investigators were mystified. We had no physical description. We had no good eyewitnesses. How do you draw up a plan to find a ghost? In a desperate move, Police Chief Moose asked residents for help. We're still convinced that people have seen something. We want to talk to them. We want to follow up. A tip line was immediately overwhelmed by callers who were sure they knew the sniper. We had over 100,000 tips come in to the tip line, which is astronomical. Detectives began working around the clock to follow every worthwhile lead and stop the killings. Meanwhile, Drew Tracy scrutinized the sniper's every move in search of a pattern. They were close to major roadways. We realized there were strip malls, and we realized that certain st stores were consistent at these places. We also realized that they knew the traffic patterns in the area of Montgomery County. Rather than get stuck in heavy southbound traffic, the killer, or killers, traveled north after a morning shooting. They went to the path of least resistance. Based on those movements, police created a plan to trap the sniper. It was called the Concentric Circle Scheme. An immediate response team would be ready to deploy within one minute of a 911 call. If we got the information within a minute, the most they could have gone was a half mile to a mile, whether it was on foot or in a vehicle. Police teams would then create a gauntlet consisting of a series of widening circles around the area. And our goal was to be on scene within two to three minutes immediately after receiving information. And basically, we would try to roadblock every one of these locations with a uniform presence. We would flood internally with plainclothes operatives. The roadblocks began to spring up everywhere. We needed to lock them into a certain location. Police searched white vans and every other suspicious vehicle. One of the biggest manhunts in US history was underway, and yet, the snipers seemed to stay one step ahead, slipping through the gauntlet at every turn. We would get ourselves just about where we thought we had things under control when something would happen in another jurisdiction. And just when detectives were convinced that they had seen the worst attacks on their citizens, the snipers spoke and assured them no one was immune to his deadly aim. P.S. The children are not safe. After three days of sniper attacks, six Washington, D.C. area residents had died from massive injuries. Only one survived. The high kill rate suggested a particular kind of suspect. We were dealing with a trained individual. Hunters have this expertise. Military has this expertise. Trained law enforcement would have this expertise. Based on the tight cluster of shootings on the first two days, police had been looking for suspects in that part of Montgomery County. But the Carolyn Sewell case in Spotsylvania had expanded the attack zone tenfold. The killer could be anywhere, and as the weekend approached, an entire region held its breath. What would be next? The killer might not be a local resident, as they had first suspected. A particular concern, the safety of school children. I had three young children. I ran them through parking lots. I made them go down on the floorboard of the car when I got gas. Throughout the weekend, school and police officials debated whether or not schools should be open. So far, none of the shootings had happened near schools. All of the school children safely returned home. No incidents, no activities at the school. Officials decided that schools would remain in session, but kids would stay indoors. I had my kids telling me, Mom, you have to go to work. You have to go to work till you catch them. We need to go back out for recess. So, you know, it's a different perspective, but it was all that you could think about. 13-year-old Iron Brown had been kicked off his school bus the week before. He'd gotten in trouble for eating candy on the bus, and his aunt had to take him to school. Iron's aunt dropped him off at school an hour early because she had to get to work. No incidents, no activities at the school. Uh, very safe day 
for young people. She turns around and there he is lying on the ground, bleeding. Iran Brown was, was really uh, losing consciousness in the car. His aunt was a nurse, she was trained, and she called the hospital ahead of time and she was racing through traffic. And she kept saying to him, hang in there, hang in there, I love you. When I first saw Iron, he was trying to die, and I wasn't sure where we, whether we were going to be able to turn that around or not. This is our home. This is our community. We, we took an oath to protect and serve. And these guys come in and make a mockery of that. But stepping over the line, shooting a kid, I guess it's getting to be really, really personal now. Many were startled to see the police chief cry, but those close to the investigation understood. It feels like failure. I mean, it is. That day, Chief Moose asked the federal government for help. The investigation changed dramatically at that juncture. The FBI brought its vast resources to search for the serial killer. A $200,000 reward was offered for information leading to an arrest. Back at the scene of Iron Brown shooting, investigators were conducting a forensic walk, stepping slowly shoulder to shoulder through the area. And two of them discovered what they thought looked like um, a flattened out area in the shrubs where maybe somebody had been laying. And they pursued that area much more intensely and with a metal rake found the shell casing. They also found a pen barrel with the ink cartridge removed they would later check it for DNA. But the biggest find of the day was a mysterious tarot card. And it said, for you, Mr. Police, code, call me God, do not release to the press. So they were using the code, call me God. It was almost like a calling card saying that it's us again and we did it. At that point in time, they did not ask for anything. And that's a scary situation. The suspects made it very clear uh, that they did not want the media notified with regard to this. The task force wanted to honor the killer's request in order to establish communication. But the media was everywhere. No secret was safe. One of the outlets used a hydraulic camera, and they raised it up two stories, and they shot through that little break in the blinds. And they got investigatively sensitive information off one of the tactical boards where we were tracking some things. And they sent crews out there. We had cops calling in saying, a uh, media truck just pulled up. Police were determined to keep the tarot card evidence away from the press. The next day, the tarot card information was leaked, and it pretty much made the front page of the Washington Post. This is the kind of reporting uh, that, while I understand wanting to get a big story, can be very devastating to a case. Just when the entire operation seemed hopelessly stranded, a powerful breakthrough lifted the spirits of the investigators. We have been taking care of a young man. Iron Brown, the 13-year-old shot at school that morning, would survive. Shell casings from Iron Brown's shooting pointed to a Bushmaster rifle, a weapon which could be lethal even in the hands of an amateur. Thank you, Chief. Sorry to keep everyone waiting tonight. I talked about uh, that you don't have to be have a military training or be an expert marksman with this gun. The previous victim had been shot in the abdomen. After I made that statement, the next victim was shot in the head. Almost as a message, if, if, if you don't think I'm that good, watch this. Dean Harold Myers was a 53-year-old civil engineer. He had won the Purple Heart after being shot in Vietnam. He was leaving work, and he just stopped to get gas because he had a long ride home back to Gaithersburg. And he got out of the car, and he's pumping gas. A 223 caliber bullet ripped through his skull. If you get a bullet wound like that to the head, it doesn't matter what you do. You're dead. There's nothing we can do. Two days later, Ken Bridges was killed while pumping gas. And on Friday, October 11th, the killer continued to prove his ruthlessness. All the 911 tapes are difficult to listen to, but this one in particular was the most bothersome. Ted and Linda Franklin had been putting shelves in the back of their car. When Ted moved towards the front of the car to adjust a seat, Linda walked to the rear of the vehicle. 
she was standing still when the fatal bullet hit. It was another shot to the head. You wiped the shot? Yes. <laughs> Worst human shot. She shot in the head. <laughs> the right side of Linda Franklin's head was completely blown off, and part of the spatter actually hit Mr. Franklin. He went to her side and called 911. Linda Franklin was the 11th victim in the Washington, D.C. area. And we felt with each new one that we weren't being successful at doing our job and protecting this community. But finally, someone caught a glimpse of the sniper. Now, that was the first good information we had of a possible suspect, as well as a good descriptor of a vehicle. Part of a, a cream or white colored Chevy van. On the next. The brutal slaying of Linda Franklin took the fear in the Washington, D.C. area to a new level. It was the 11th shooting in 10 days. Even worse, Linda was killed in front of her husband. Just to have your family member present on the scene of the shooting was a first. But this time, there was an eyewitness. Matthew Dowdy said he was walking out of the Home Depot when he saw the killer. A, uh... Mid-Eastern style male, complected, crouching down, taking a shot with an AK-74. He described a white or cream-colored van with a burned-out taillight. Now, that was the first good information we had of a possible suspect, as well as a good descriptor of a vehicle. An alert went out to the public. We do want people to continue to watch for things that are out of place, strange behavior, report that. I'm pleased to say that people continue to call our tip line. There are more bad guys than there are cops, but there aren't more bad guys than there are good guys. So when you put the good guys out there and you ask them to help you with the task, it's a force multiplier, and that's what we were counting on in this case. Two days later, a detective was working late, reviewing the surveillance tapes from Home Depot. And then I received a call from Fairfax County PD. We have uh, some internal video uh, footage at the Home Depot that shows this individual inside during that period of time. At 9.21 p.m., Dowdy appeared on the in-store security videotape three minutes after the shooting. And they realized that this was a, a false lookout and that uh, false suspect information. The eyewitness turned out to be a hoax, just someone looking for media attention. Two weeks after the shootings began, the investigators were back to square one. All the suspects they had under surveillance during Linda Franklin's shooting could now be eliminated. Sleep deprived and frustrated, the investigators knew that to catch the sniper, they'd have to work even harder. You just couldn't walk away from the case. I didn't want to go off shift. Um, you know, your bosses had to send you home. Um, get your sleep, you're gonna have to come back tomorrow, it's a new day. And you'd go home, and on your way home, there was another shooting incident just around the corner. My dear, sweet administrative aide, Sue Austin, had gone out early on to Kmart and bought me some socks because I couldn't even get home and do my laundry. Before this case, Barney Forsythe had been planning to retire from the police force. But those plans were now on hold. It would have been very difficult for me to walk out the door and turn this over to somebody else. The detectives had no idea that their best lead yet was sitting on a couch across the country in Tacoma, Washington. I encourage everyone to call. Don't assume we have your information. Do not assume that the information you have is no good. As Robert Holmes watched the coverage of the D.C. sniper shootings, he had an alarming revelation. He somehow has his gut feeling that his friend John Muhammad is behind this. John Muhammad had been his buddy in the Army. He owned a long-range rifle, just like the one shown in the news reports. And here was the clincher. John had an estranged wife who had taken custody of their children and moved to the Washington, D.C. area. So he calls the FBI tip line and his tip gets completely lost. Ironically, the sniper wanted to talk to the task force too, but he was having trouble getting past the chaos he'd created. Bradfield City Police, love calls, this line is recorded. Good morning, don't say anything, just listen. 
Where are the people that are causing the killing in your area? Look on the tarot card. It says, call me God. Sir, I need Get to report you to that Montgomery County Police Hotline. We're not investigating the car line. you like the number? For some reason, the sniper had dialed the wrong number. I don't know what they were paying attention to in that they couldn't find the right number to call. 9424. That 800 number was out there. It was out there. Further complicating the situation, other callers were also taking credit for the crimes. The real sniper got lost in the shuffle. They got desperate for law enforcement to, to accept that they were the killers when they called. So they brought up a shooting in Montgomery, Alabama, and asked us to look into that shooting. It was a, you got to believe me, I'm the sniper, and here's how you can tell I'm the sniper. I immediately called uh, Montgomery, Alabama, and I asked if anyone handled a situation at an ABC store. And he said, he said, yes, we had a robbery, homicide. Although the case was unsolved, the gun used in the crime was not a Bushmaster, and the sniper wasn't known to rob his victims. It wasn't a strong lead. Saturday, October 19th. Jeff and Stephanie Hopper were driving back to their home in Florida. When they pulled off I-95 in Ashland, Virginia to fill up their car and have dinner, they figured they were out of the danger zone. They were walking out of the Ponderosa restaurant together after a nice dinner, and they were holding hands. They heard an explosion. It took a moment before Jeff realized he had been shot in the abdomen. His wife struggled to unlock her cell phone to call 911. Jeff underwent five surgeries in 18 days. He would eventually make a complete recovery. In the nearby woods, an ATF dog found a bullet casing and a note tacked to a tree. The note was tucked inside a Ziploc Halloween bag. The killer was getting sloppy. There was DNA on the Ziploc bag that the note was contained in. It's actually one of the ways in which law enforcement can pick up DNA is with the Ziploc mechanism that, that draws the DNA from the fingers as you, as you do that. The DNA, however, didn't match anything in the FBI's national database. After the test was completed, investigators read the note. For you, Mr. Police, call me God. And then it went on to make demands, very specific demands of what was expected of law enforcement to make the killings end. The sniper wanted $10 million placed in a bank account. Once I heard that they were looking for really an exorbitant amount of money, but I really felt very confident that we were going to get them. The sniper also wrote that at 6 AM, he would call the Ponderosa restaurant, where Jeffrey Hopper had been shot. We missed the time cut off because of the DNA analysis. So Chief Moose went out with a very specific communication in a press conference following the discovery of what was on the note. To the person who left us a message at the Ponderosa last night, we do want to talk to you. Call us at the number you provided. Thank you. On the morning of October 21st, the call came. Finally, the police and the sniper we're in direct contact. Is this the Ponderosa? Um, who is this? Don't say anything. Just listen. Call was traced to an Exxon station. 33 minutes later, two men were arrested, one with a white van. But these men were simply two illegal immigrants near the wrong phone at the wrong time. The task force regrouped and focused on the strange wording in the sniper's last message. You caught the sniper like a duck in a noose. Um, we didn't know what that meant when we first read it. We, uh, we all looked at each other cross-eyed and didn't know what what those words meant. The sniper's note mentioned the Alabama shooting once again.
A second call to Montgomery, Alabama revealed more information. A gun magazine had been dropped at the crime scene. It had a fingerprint on it, but local officials said they had not processed the print. And we were never able to actually check that print because we don't have the resources here in our town. The magazine was immediately flown to Washington. And lo and behold, the fingerprint matches Lee Boyd Malvo. Lee Boyd Malvo was a 17-year-old from Jamaica. He had been fingerprinted by immigration officials in Bellingham, Washington. So that gave us basically an individual and a face to a fingerprint. Police were convinced that the teenager had an accomplice. If we could just have 24 hours with this information before the media gets a hold of it, that we could catch them. But if this were to leak, they would be in the wind and probably not surface for a very long time. Over three weeks, the snipers had brutally shot 12 people in the greater Washington, D.C. area. Just as police felt they were hot on their trail, the snipers struck again. They came back and they hit us once again in the heart of Montgomery County on October 22nd. Conrad Johnson, a 35-year-old Jamaican-born bus driver, was the next victim. He was shot and killed as he was at the front steps of his bus, ready to do his route. At the scene, a new message had been tacked to a tree. Your incompetence has cost you another life. The FBI had set aside $100,000 in case a negotiation was necessary. But the sniper task force was beginning to put the pieces of the puzzle together. The fingerprint on the magazine, dropped at a liquor store robbery in Montgomery, Alabama, had led them to 17-year-old Lee Boyd Malvo. Malvo was fingerprinted on the West Coast on an immigration issue. Malvo was born in Jamaica. An immigration report from Bellingham, Washington, revealed a custody battle between his mother and a man named John Muhammad. When they get the narrative that was written up, it mentions a John Muhammad. A John Muhammad who's connected to Lee Boy Malvo. Muhammad had helped Malvo and his mother enter the United States illegally from a Caribbean island. Then, John Muhammad and Lee Malvo became friends, often passing themselves off as father and son. In Tacoma, Washington, FBI agents played the tapes of the sniper for Muhammad's friend, Robert Holmes. He was a longtime friend of John Muhammad's from the Army. They confided in each other. Um, who is this? Don't say anything. Just Holmes had called the tip line five days earlier. He recognized the voice as Lee Malvo, a kid who hung out with Muhammad. Holmes also gave the agents a possible motive. He knew that John Muhammad was devastated when he lost his children to Mildred. Mildred was John Muhammad's ex-wife. When Muhammad had threatened to kill her, she took her children and went into hiding. In the Washington, D.C. area, Holmes led the agents to a tree stump in his backyard that Malvo and Muhammad had used for target practice. Back in Baltimore, the task force was closing in on their suspects. We ended up getting the uh, tag number, which was a New Jersey plate, description of the vehicle uh, listed to Mr. Muhammad. We knew we were looking for a blue Chevy Caprice with New Jersey tags, and we realized we were looking for at least two or more individuals. We're keeping our fingers crossed that this is the right thing. Whitney Donahue repaired industrial refrigerators for a living. He had been working late that night in Manassas, Virginia. At about 11.30, I decided to go home. I got my van started on the Route 66. Home was a couple of long, dark hours away. To stay awake, he turned on the radio. We are looking for a blue Chevy Caprice with New Jersey tags NDA21Z. Whitney had owned a Chevy Caprice, so he knew exactly what he was looking for. I started scanning the cars as I went in towards the Beltway, and then I got on Route 70 and decided to stop at the rest area on South Mountain. And as I turned in, I seen the Caprice. It was dark blue. And then as I came on in, I could see the front tag, and it was what I had written down, and I pulled in right directly across in front of them picked up my cell phone and uh, called 911. I could hear them, but they couldn't hear me. They hung up on me. I tried it again, the same thing happened. Finally, he got through to the 911 operator. Well, they asked me to go back and 
check the car one more time. Whitney worried about pushing his luck with the snipers. He spotted a man near the restrooms and asked him to check the plate. I told him to lightly toot his horn and verify that definitely it was it. The Maryland State Police and the various people involved said to Whitney, stay on the line. Tell us what you're seeing. Tell us what you're hearing. And then this huge command operation came into play. I remember uh, driving as fast as I can to the location. I remember seeing helicopters in the air. And I remember coming up. It was a very cool, crisp night. It was very quiet up there. They shut down the highway. Tactical teams prepared for a shootout. These are the same individuals who trained together and worked together for the prior two and a half to three weeks. They planned the takedown. They got in the wood line and they executed. I remember looking down at Malvo and seeing beads of sweat on his forehead. And this is October, it was cool, and he didn't say a word. And I looked down, walked over to John Muhammad, and I saw his face. He was angry. It was a quick operation, and everybody knew we had them, and everybody was relieved, and everybody was glad it was over. I was extremely tired, both uh, physically and psychologically. But as exhausted as he was, there was one thing Barney Forsyth had to do. I stopped actually by the school that, where my wife, Marsha, works. Uh, called her out of her classroom and put my arms around her. And I said, we got him. And I said, you can't tell anybody right now because it hadn't been released, but we got him. We are gathered to share some information with regards to a sniper situation that has been occurring in the Washington metropolitan area. At approximately 1 o'clock AM today, a motorist called 911 to report seeing a 1990 Chevy Caprice. And I was home at the time watching the news, and my kids were there, and they were you know, jumping up and down. Does this mean we're going to have recess again? We can at least say that there's some family that's going to be together tonight because we got it done. For several days, Lee Boyd Malvo remained silent. But finally, Detective June Boyle got him to talk. Would you like some juice, maybe, or some fruit, or some salad? He was hungry. He wanted a veggie burger, and that started the process. We sent out for a veggie burger, two of them, in fact, and uh, some water. Once he started eating and talking, everything just flowed pretty well. A couple of veggie burgers? Malvo told her that he would fast before killing because it improved his aim. He just was bragging about how they had planned to do five killings in one day, he said, because he knew the police couldn't handle it. He gave details of each killing. In the Franklin shooting, he said he aimed at Ted Franklin first. And Lynn Franklin moved to the back of the car. He said it only took him two seconds. He locked onto her and shot her. He pointed to his head, laughed about it, said it was a great shot. Today, many investigators believe the killing spree was a twisted plot by John Muhammad to kill his ex-wife and get his children back. I think it's very plausible that he intended to kill her and make her one of the random victims. John Muhammad had hatred. He was involved, I think, when they finally put it all together at the end, it was between 24 and 26 shootings throughout this nation that were involved by both of these individuals. He taught hatred to Lee Boyd Malvo. In 2004, John Allen Muhammad was sentenced to death by a Virginia court. He is appealing that verdict. 17-year-old Lee Boyd Malvo received a life sentence.